beyond the rear view mirror, I describe what this is about, putting the past behind us and nailing the door shut so that those things in our past don't hinder our future in any way. The images that I've had for this is the brick, which is constant with the different training camps because I'm giving you bricks that you can build something with. You have to do the building. On this one, I've got a little extra. We got a door on the side and a big nail because we need a big nails to nail those doors shut. And our first lesson was review, not to go over and remember in the sense of repeating in our minds something that happened, but viewing it differently, viewing it from God's perspective, asking God specifically to show us truth about those things in our past that we didn't see at the time, we may still not see. Our second lesson was rehearse. Once you get the new view, then you want to rehearse that instead of the way you tended to rehearse the, the uh, pain, the suffering, the, the sadness. And the third lesson last week was empty. We looked at the fact that emptiness can be a gift if it gives us room to receive something better from God. Today, we're going to look at uproot. Some things we need to uproot. The lesson is specifically about no root of bitterness. It's very important. A root of bitterness can be very insidious, very subtle, very sneaky. Once a root gets down in there, it can start to break things apart. It can grow bigger and bigger and hinder. What we've been talking about is that you need to seek God for a new view, as I said, and be praying and talking to him and asking him to show you the way that we do that because these are ways that bring us into God's presence is PPS. Praise, pray in the spirit, soak in the scripture. And as you're doing that, listen. Anything anybody wants to share this week about something God may have shown you? As I've shared with y'all in the Destiny training camp, especially the idea that we try to hear from God and then we try. Okay, I think God, you're saying this. So then I'm going to go. Trusting that as I'm going, the Lord will direct my steps. That's what the scripture says. The Lord directs the steps of the righteous man, not the butt sitting of the righteous man. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I know that's not in the scripture the way you all have it, is it? But that's, that's true. That's the reality of it. We want to hear an audible voice and be shoved out of our seats sometimes. And God wants us to listen and try and trust then that as we're going, if necessary, he'll redirect, he'll turn us. Then with this idea of what do you see, and that's what we're constantly asking ourselves, what do I see? And am I seeing things as God wants me to see them? Or am I seeing the way I remember them distorted? We want to look at Hebrews 12, 15. This is where the term root of bitterness comes from. It says, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble and by it defiling many. We don't want a root of bitterness. What would you say bitterness looks like? And I've got a few answers that I'll give you, but I just have a space in there for you to write whatever, and, and y'all throw out answers. What do you think bitterness looks like? Anger. Anger. Resentment. Resentment. Meanness. Meanness. Yeah? Um, Holding on to a grudge, yeah? I think bitterness can be subtle. I think that sometimes we have bitterness that we don't even realize that's way down inside of us. Absolutely. And that's another reason why we need to review Ask God to show us a new view, even of ourselves, of, of what's going on in our hearts. I had anger, fear, worry. I think those are all things that a root of bitterness shows up as. And all the other things that were mentioned, I think those were great too. What would you say leads to bitterness? Unforgiveness, unforgiveness, unforgiveness. Anything else? Hurt? Hurt and pain. Pain, yeah. Offense. Offense, yeah. We're going to look now at the rest of that passage that leads up to verse 15. 
even if we just backed up a few verses, verse 12 starts with therefore. What does therefore mean? What is there? <laughs> what is that therefore? Yes, there's some different little gimmicks that I heard people use to help them remember or to think through. When I see a therefore, what's that therefore? Whenever there's a therefore, it's saying that because of something before, this is then the result. So we want to back up even before verse 12 and see what the cause is that's leading up to this root of bitterness. First, in verse 7, it says, endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. So the first thing we see there is suffering. Pain, like somebody said. Forgiveness, certainly, but just pain. And it can be a kind of perceived suffering, whether it's real or not. Sometimes we feel like somebody's offended us and they haven't really done anything, they really didn't intend anything, or we feel like God didn't pull through and do what we thought he should do. As we've looked at many times in this training camp and other ones, all the situations in our life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the devil means it for evil, God means it for good. Here it's saying endure suffering as discipline. Discipline is not just punishment. This isn't necessarily talking about suffering because it did something bad. It's just suffering. That can be a discipline because God is dealing with us as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had natural fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? For they, that is, earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he, God, does it for our benefit. For sure, no question, no doubt, so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the fruit of peace and righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Trained. It's my gymnasium word. I love that word. Therefore, since all this stuff that we just read, what are we supposed to do? There's some things we're supposed to do. Strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight, or some translations say smooth, paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. I've had this sort of picture in my mind for uh, some time about this idea of making smooth, straight paths so that your feet don't get uh, lame. You know, if you've been injured, you need to be careful, right? Sometimes you get a cast to protect that. Sometimes you don't need a cast. you got a walker or something to protect that. And I feel like even as Christians, we still have some lame parts oftentimes in our bodies, in our spirits, in our relationships, in our hearts. If you think about it, if you've ever sprained an ankle and you're getting better, but then you're walking along and you hit something funny and you twist it again, it just could do even more damage than the first time. This all sounds great, right? Strengthen your tired hands, weaken knees, make straight paths for your feet so that you'll be healed. Okay, how? We want to keep going and find out how in this passage and some other ones that we'll look at. The biggest one right here, right now, is pursue peace with everyone. Doesn't say have peace with everyone, but pursue peace with everyone. And that is the things we've just been talking about. Forgiveness. Making things right between people. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Make sure that no one falls short. And there we are leading now back into the verse I started with. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and by it defiling many. So you see the connection here between making straight, smooth paths for our feet to be healed with pursuing peace with everyone. So if we don't look at suffering as discipline, that is an opportunity to grow, or if we don't strengthen tired hands and weak knees, sometimes if we just keep pushing on doing the same things we're doing and they just keep getting weaker, then if we don't make smooth paths and pursue peace with everyone, what is lame may not get healed but further injured. And I gotta say, I've experienced that. A lot of times with well-meaning people telling me, I, honestly, now that I'm saying that, I'm, I've done it to people <laughs> unintentionally. Oh, you just gotta do this and this and this, and you know, you all, it'll all work out. And 
didn't work out because I wasn't encouraging them to seek God. I wasn't always seeking God. I wanted a formula, and that doesn't work. And if these things happen, then that root of bitterness can take hold and spring up, causing trouble, all kinds of trouble for us and for others. If you've ever noticed a little crack will get in a sidewalk or a road and a little something falls in it, a little water, and then it gets cold and it freezes and it breaks open a little more, a little dirt falls in there, a little seed of something falls in there, and soon, if nothing is done, that becomes a shrub, a tree, and it totally can break open concrete pavement. So what do we want to do? We want to deal with the root of the bitterness, hopefully before it gets that big. But certainly, once we realize it, at whatever point, we want to rip the root out, not just cut off the plant. So what leads to bitterness? First, from what we just read, is suffering. And then here again, what might be entailed in suffering that leads to bitterness? I got a few answers here, but maybe you all have some other ones. What do you think leads to Bitterness. We've talked about unforgiveness. Anything else? Hurtful words. Rehearsing, Rehearsing it, yes. yes. Yeah, and all of this is a part of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness, like bitterness, may seem like a little something, no big deal. But it grows. Especially if we rehearse it, then it takes deep, strong root and doesn't want to come out. Betrayal, yeah. Rejection, yes. I think not being in the Word, not being in the Word. Yeah, and, and I would expand on that to say not soaking in the Word. And I know that's my thing, and so sure, I'm going to say that, but it's because I believe it. <laughs> because it's actually soaking in the Scripture to let it soak in us and to get to know God better, not just to learn the do this or don't do that or to check it off. Jealousy, definitely. Now, I've got a blank there just for you all to fill in. I've got a few things that you can put in if you want to. In addition to that, mistreatment was kind of already mentioned. Sin, our own sin, can be a cause of this loss. I mean, something that is not, quote unquote, anybody's fault. Just losing a loved one. And I would kind of categorize this all with the phrase that I've used before is, if only. If only this hadn't happened. If only I had been able to do this instead of that. If only. And I catch myself doing this too. And I try to review and find the better truth that God's still in control and God's moving things along even if it doesn't seem like it. And then rehearse that instead of the if only's. Roots of bitterness. And we, this is the main thing we've covered is relationships. It has to do with relationships. Something between you and me, something between me and God, something within myself, but mostly it's relationships. We see that in Matthew 6, where the disciples had asked Jesus to teach them to pray, and he gives them the prayer that we know of as the Lord's Prayer, and a lot of Christian groups recite that regularly in their worship services. But there's just a couple of phrases in there that are very important for what we're talking about today. Jesus said, you should pray like this. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive people their wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. This is very sobering, very serious. As I said, a lot of groups say this prayer every time they get together. It's part of every worship service. But I want to ask us to think about do I really dare to pray, Father, forgive me like I forgive others? Because that's what that means. I want to be able to pray that with an open heart, with a fresh, clean heart. So I go to God and I ask him to forgive me. And I also ask him, God, help me to forgive others. Help me. It's not like an absolute, I don't think, that, oh, man, there was this one thing you, did, you didn't forgive, so God's not. It's, it's not that, but he's just pointing out how important this is, that forgiveness is not optional. It's essential. <clears throat> Some translations and other gospels use the word trespasses. I particularly chose this one in the debtors, and you'll see why in a little bit, but it encompasses anything that we have against somebody or they have against us that they did to us, or we think they did to us, or we did to them, any 
offense was a word used earlier, and then it grows and it builds and it multiplies because what you rehearse today becomes your tomorrow. So choose carefully what you rehearse. That's why I emphasize so much we've got to seek God because we could be trying to forget, in, in a sense, burying something that needs to be dealt with we're not dealing with, or, on the other hand, we could be taking something that we're just going over it and over it and over it and over it so that it's becoming that root of bitterness. So we, we've got to have God's discernment to show us what needs to be dealt with and how. We see from these kinds of conversations which y'all are sharing with us and sp from the scripture too that forgiveness is for our benefit. When I forgive somebody, it's not for them, it's for me. As we saw, it's going to stop that root of bitterness from developing and causing trouble and defiling many, including me. Y'all have talked about some things that you've already dealt with, but take a minute now and pray about this. God, is there somebody right now that I have not forgiven? Somebody who has wronged me? And I have a space for you to write in there. And I make these spaces small because <laughs> I don't want you to go over the whole thing again. <laughs> don't rehearse the bad, but I forgive blank, a person's name, for blank. Take a few minutes and pray about that and see if there's something that God wants you to write down because these are just words, but words are essential. Words are powerful. And though words don't instantly change feelings, it's a part of the process. The first step in the process that we'll look at some other things that will help to change to, so that we not only know in our head that we are forgiven or that we have forgiven somebody else, but it's real deep down in the heart. So take a few minutes we'll quietly and pray about that. Okay, so forgiveness is essential. And another question that we ask, and I know you already know the answer to this, is how often do we have to forgive? Peter tried to get away with that one. <laughs> And the answer is, it's limitless. As Jesus answered when Peter said, do I have to forgive my brother seven times? I mean, seven times, that's a huge number. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven, as in more than you could even count. Never quit. And how important is forgiveness? It's critical and it's life changing. It is critical and it is essential because it's life changing. It can be life-changing for the person we're forgiving, but for sure it's going to be life-changing for us. As many of you have already attested to becoming free from something because you chose to forgive somebody who wronged you. When Peter asked that question of Jesus, how many times must I forgive my brother? And Jesus said 70 times. Then Jesus went on to tell the parable of the master and the slaves who owed him money. And that's why I said I used the debtor thing because that's the analogy that's used here in the rest of this scripture of a debt that is owed. And he said that the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought before him. I looked that up and there's some variation, but basically it says that that's $100,000 in our day. 10,000 talents, $100,000. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, which I looked up again, it was like a few bucks, 10, 20 bucks. He grabbed him, started choking him and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? 
And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Now that seems really, really harsh. At the very least, it's very sobering and it intended to help us to know how serious this is and how important it is. But also it's to show us the difference between whatever pitily, and I'm sorry, I've never experienced what y'all have been describing and I praise God for it. So I don't want to demean that in any way or make it seem little, but compared to what God forgave all of us for, anything that we might have offense against somebody else is nothing compared to what he was willing to give up, the debt that he paid of ours for that. We might say, again, I've not experienced anything like y'all have shared. I know that's got to be horrible. But we might say, I can't forgive that offense is too great. That's just beyond forgiveness. I mean, do you know how badly I've been mistreated? And it sounds like that's what y'all were thinking at, at first until God helped you to get through that. But how badly have we mistreated Jesus, in a sense, because all the suffering that he experienced was because of us, because of our sins. It says that the master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured, and so will my heavenly Father do to you. I think what it's saying there, I don't think y'all need to worry that God's going to hand us over to be tortured. I think what it's saying is that because we choose to go our own way, God's hand of protection is off of us. And so the things of this life that I was saying, all this stuff that may be happening to us, the devil wants to make it turn into evil and God wants to make it good. And we want to go that way instead of God's way. And he's like, okay, you're out from under my umbrella. You're out from under my protection. I don't have anything anywhere near as serious of what some of y'all have shared, but I wanted to share one instance in my life where God spoke to me about something like this because it was a little unusual in what God said. <laughs> of course, when I say that, I think that everything seems to be unusual that God says to me or does with me, but that's cool. He's a good God. But I had been uh, on staff at a church and I'd been teaching there. I wasn't uh, credentialed then as a pastor, but I was on the pastoral rotation as far as answering calls when the church was closed and visiting people and stuff like that. But some things changed, and I had a new boss, and another layer of pastors came in, and so then I was under not the senior pastor, but another one. And things that I had done before, like volunteering to teach a class, I was told that I was trying to elevate myself. I felt like God was calling me that at that point to become a pastor, to get my credentials, so I did what I thought I should do. I went to my boss, pastor, and told him that. He, again made it sound like I was just trying to lift myself up instead of just wanting to follow God's calling. I had been given an assignment to head up a ministry of discipleship, which is what I love to do and what I feel like God's called me to do by the senior pastor. But then my pastor boss wouldn't actually let me do it because he said I'd never led a successful ministry before, that I didn't have what it took. That was a pretty miserable year or two for me. And I got so angry with him. <laughs> I have to admit that there was one time where I had to like walk away to stop from throwing something at him. I was so angry when he was saying some of these things about, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm volunteering and you're saying I'm trying to lift myself up and elevate myself. That's not the way it works. I knew I had to let go of this. I knew that God had everything in control and lots of other things. I started out trying to get my credentials in that denomination and was allowed to go so far and then stopped. And then they allowed me to go again until I was done with everything and all I had to do was take the exam interview and I wasn't allowed again. God had a different plan. I didn't see it at the time, I was just mad. But God told me to write a psalm about this pastor, like David, starting out with, yeah, he did this and this and this and this and this, but praise God, that you're in control. Praise God that you're doing this. I mean, I don't remember the details of it, but that was all a part of it. I was angry. I knew I had to not only verbally forgive him, but I had to find a way to walk it out, to live it, to make it real in me. And that was the way that God chose at that point to help me to do that, was to write a psalm about this guy. And God will do things 
that we might not expect, but you have to be willing to sometimes do some things that are unusual. Did he speak to you, your lesson that you learned from it? What you yeah, said? he had other plans for me. There's a lot of detail that I can't get into, but yeah, that was the bottom line, was God was in control, and he had other plans for me, and this was a part of moving me. I don't want to rehearse any more than I need to to tell you the story, but I can see for sure that God had something else for me. At one point, see, I was blaming them for stopping me. They didn't stop me. I found another way because God convicted me. You can't say that it's their fault. I called you to be a pastor, so you find a way to be a pastor. And I did. And then when I came here, Brian helped me in the church, paid for me to go through the Assemblies of God District School of Ministry. But that wouldn't have happened if everything had gone the way I thought it would, should have gone in the previous place. And this has just opened up all kinds of doors of ministry for me. And that was what I was saying in the psalm ahead of time. Thank you that that is what you're doing, God. Thank you that you have a path that I haven't seen yet. And then as I practiced that thankfulness, I actually saw it come to pass. Sometimes you never see. But because of the other times that you have seen, that helps you to have the faith that this time, even though you still don't see, that he's doing something good. How do we strengthen, straighten, and pursue? It's pursuing peace. Peace with God and pursuing peace with other people. Looking back at that scripture again, strengthen your tired hands, make straight paths, pursue peace with everyone. And that's forgiveness, that choice to forgive. The word pursue tells you what? You got to chase after it. You got to work on it. It's not just going to walk up to you. You got to go after it. It may keep getting ahead of you, but you keep chasing it. You keep going after it and doing what you need to do and asking God. I already reminded you of that. What you rehearsed today becomes your tomorrow. So we need to review our yesterday and let God give us a new view. Well, we're going to look a little bit at Peter some more. There was a time when Peter is an example of this. I want to show you a time when Jesus gave Peter the opportunity to review his failure and gave him something better to rehearse. We see that in John 18. We've talked a lot about people being renamed in the scripture and what their names meant and what the new name that God gave them, what that meant, and how God was giving them something, a new reality to rehearse. First, we're going to look at the fact that Jesus had given Simon, his name had been Simon, and he gave him the name. We call him Peter, but what does that mean? Rocky. He named him Rocky. <laughs> but first, we're going to look at his need for something new to rehearse, his failure. And this, of course, is when Jesus had been arrested and taken off, and the, some of the disciples were kind of following after him. Jesus had told Rocky that he was going to deny him three times, and it happens. And I'm not going to read all this. It's real familiar. It says the servant girl kept the door, said to Rocky, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And Rocky said, I'm not. And now the servants and officers and had made a fire of coals. Pay attention to that. They stood there by this fire, warming themselves, and Rocky stood with them and warmed himself. He betrays Jesus three times. This was prophesied, as I said, and as soon as Rocky said that third time, I don't know him, the rooster crowed, which was also what Jesus had predicted. Imagine his frame of mind, his feeling at that point. This man whom I have devoted my life to these past few years and who has cared for me and shown me so much, I just acted like I don't even know him. Going forward, how would Rocky remember this? How would he rehearse this? I pointed out to you that that phrase there, and your, your translation may say a charcoal fire, but the, the Greek word there is not a blazing fire, but like charcoal briquettes that are glowing and putting out warmth. That phrase is only used two times in the scripture. The only other time that it's used is after Jesus' resurrection, when we've got to get to Rocky's re new rehearsal. And the scripture from John 21, where Jesus appears to them, they've been out fishing, and he, uh, Rocky jumps out of the boat to come be with him, and Jesus is actually making breakfast for them over, of all things, 
a charcoal fire. That same phrase. Only other place in the, the Bible that it's used. And this is where Jesus said to him, Simon, do you love me? And of course, Rocky says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus asks it again, Simon, do you love me? And Rocky says, yes, of course, you, I love you. And also each time he says this, then Jesus says to him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. So you got a charcoal fire where Rocky denies him. You got a charcoal fire where Jesus gives Rocky the opportunity to affirm him. Three times, Rocky denied him. Three times, Jesus gives him the opportunity to affirm. And he gives him, like, I don't hold that against you, Rocky, because I'm entrusting you with a responsibility and ministry. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He is giving Rocky a new reality to rehearse instead of that of his failure. And Jesus can do that for us. I've shared numerous times of, of different things in my life where he's done that. If you talk to him, he will do that for you. Sometimes I wonder if people, how do I say this? Sometimes I wonder if y'all believe me. <laughs> Has anybody else ever experienced anything like this? What I've experienced, I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> You know, I had to forgive some very hard things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So God can give us a new reality. He can give us something new to rehearse, something better to rehearse, a promise for the future or a new view of the past or something that seems to have gone awry, but we see that God's hand is in it and he's taking us a different way. It's interesting to me that I didn't start out with the expectation that I was going to run into all these names and renaming things. But every one of these main Bible stories that I've pulled out for the purposes of the forgiveness and the past and dealing with it has had some aspect of somebody who was had a certain name that meant one thing, but God knew they needed to remember something else and he gave them a new name. Here, Jesus is the one who gave Simon the new name Rocky but here, when he's talking to him, he calls him Simon. Now, Simon doesn't seem to have any great significant name, but I, I find myself wondering, well, why didn't Jesus call him Rocky? I mean, he's the one who gave him the name. Surely he would be, I, I don't know, except that it, it makes me think of how we are, that we have a new nature, we have a new reality, yet there's that pull of the old also. And sometimes it seems like we're going back and forth and back and forth. But we need to practice, work on, try, ask God to help us to focus on that new nature, that new name, that new reality, whatever it is that he's given to each one of us. Well, we want to look at another specific area from Ephesians 6 about parents and children. We all have parents. <laughs> and a very powerful relationship is that of parent and child. Parents are far from perfect. Some are not just imperfect, but abusive. It's a common source of disappointment that can lead to bitterness and a need for forgiveness. So Ephesians 6, 2 through 3 says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. I don't know what kind of parents you had. And we're all grown up now, many of us, my parents are dead, mine are. But there's still that connection, those memories, whether they're still here or whether they're gone. The most loving parents aren't perfect. Maybe you had that kind. Maybe you had the horrible kind. Parents who neglect, abandon, literally or emotionally. But I, I have to say this gently but firmly, the scripture doesn't differentiate. So don't even entertain the thought that this doesn't apply to your parents. And I'm not saying this is easy, but it's the truth. The commandment also has a promise. You honor your parents so that you will live a long, good life here on earth. My parents were good people. 
They raised us in a good moral environment, took us to church, but they were very stoic, no emotions. I've told you all before, I never heard anybody say, I love you. I realized that was part of my if only. If only my parents had been more affectionate, if only. Things were better after I became a Christian because I saw this and I took this seriously, but still definitely not great. We weren't really close. I read this book about honoring your parents, and it specifically encouraged people, and this is it said also whether your parents are living or dead, that you needed to honor them. And if you've had a bad relationship, that there have been hurt feelings, you needed to deal with that even if they're gone and you can't talk to them. And what they encouraged you to do was write a letter to them, a letter of honor. And you may need God to somehow re reveal something to you if you've had the really horrible, abusive, terrible parents. How do I honor them? God, you've got to show me. I actually did this. I wrote a letter of honor to my parents, and they were still living at the time. And I read it to them, and they kind of listened politely and like, okay. <laughs> so I don't know if it did anything for them. It sure didn't do anything for me. It wasn't definitely wasn't what I hoped. But as the scripture says, honor all parents, not just perfect parents. And so I'm trying to figure this out, and I went that far, and that really didn't seem to make a whole lot of difference. And one day, a number of years later, I was at a Mother's Day church gathering. The speaker was someone who, and they always seem to find these kind of speakers to do these things, that she was up there telling us about what a wonderful relationship she had with her mother, and they were the closest friends, and they did everything together. And I'm sitting there thinking, mm -hmm. <laughs> and honestly, I got up and left in tears, feeling cheated because I didn't have that kind of mother. And somebody mentioned to me in the break of something else that was going on in their life that they had to forgive God. And that may not be something we think of in, intentionally, but in a sense, we blame God for these things. Whose fault was it my parents were like they were? Whose fault was it that I was born into that family? It was God's fault. So in a sense, I'm blaming God for this, that you didn't give me the weird parents. Da, 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 da. So I had, to, I had to work through that too. But I had overcome a lot of the rebellion of my teenage years and young adults. And, but the relationship still wasn't good in this painful time that just made me feel awful. This person talking about how wonderful their life was with their mother. And I sought God. God, help. You know, I don't want it to be this way. I don't want to be angry with my parents. I don't want to just feel like I've been cheated. And he led me to write another letter. Not for them. This one was for me. Remember that I said I never heard I love you, and that was the kind of thing I rehearsed. Over and over in my head, I never heard him say I love you. But in this letter, I rehearsed the love that I had never even occurred to me, but God helped me to see that Every time my mother stayed up late making a new outfit for me, she was saying, I love you. And every time my parents came to one of my basketball games, even though they didn't have a clue what was going on, they were saying, I love you. They never missed a concert or a play I was in. They were saying, I love you. God enabled me through this letter, through listening for him, to review my past. And I don't know, many of these things that I share, please understand that I'm not thinking that this is then you got to go do this or this is what God's going to do for you. Who knows what God's going to do for you, but he will do something if you ask, if you seek. And it might take some tries. It might take several times. It might take periods of years even for some of these things like I've shared with, but he will do that. And so God enabled me to review my past. Remember when we talked about Sarah from Genesis 17, 18, something that I pointed out for all of that she went through and her lack of faith and all that, she was in communication with God. She wasn't just talking to God, she was hearing him. And we have to do that too. It's great to go to God with our problems, but we need to not just da, 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 God fix this, make this, this is wrong. Stop, listen. And the things that we do that help us to do that, coming into his presence, as I said, were praise, praying in the spirit, and soaking in the scripture. We need to remind ourselves from Sarah to our life to everything else that God is already working his plan. 
in this situation that seems impossible, in this pain from our past that seems like we can't overcome it. And when we praise him especially, we're affirming that. We're rehearsing that, God, you're in control. So I want to do that. Spend some time. I've got a few praise songs for us to sing. We'll spend a few minutes praying in the Spirit, and then we'll soak in the Scripture. And I specifically want to go over that Scripture again, Ephesians 6, 2 to 3, soak in that, and Matthew 6, 9 through 15 about forgiveness. As we're doing this, asking God, where were you? Where are you? What are you doing that I haven't seen? And be prepared to jot down any thoughts that you might have while we're doing this.